Good morning, everyone. And welcome. Thank you all for coming. My name is Kelly Brothers of Genevieve's Burford and Brothers, KCRA, KFBK. And on the weekend, I'm a barista at Starbucks. So. <laughs> Um, great to be with you uh, again. Anne Marie asked me to do this. Usually, I'm kind of a a slave to radio these mornings, tied to a microphone till nine o'clock. But Anne Marie and I go way back. I have great high school stories if any of you want to hear them. Uh, but I'll lay off those uh, this morning. But what a great weekend we have here in Sacramento. Think of everything going on: the Amgen tour, the Republic game. Hunter Pence is playing at Rayleigh Field tonight, which. My 10-year-old daughter is very excited about, and uh, not to mention Mother's Day coming up. Ha Happy Mother's Day to all the moms who are out there in the audience. I remember the first show I ever did at KCRA, the first time I anchored the evening news, my mom said, hey, come by and have dinner after the show. So I did, and I walked in, and she said, oh, they're just what I've always wanted, a son who wears more makeup than I do. That was long before Bruce Jenner. Um, let's, uh, sorry. Let's begin the program by recognizing the generous champion sponsors who have each contributed $1,000 to this great event. Uh, please hold your applause till the end. But we want to thank our sponsors, Kaiser Permanente, Porter Scott, Sacramento Credit Union, California Athle uh, excuse me, Al Alcoholic Beverage Control's Target Responsibility for Alcohol-Connected Emergencies, otherwise known as the TRACE Unit, California Correctional Peace Officers Association, Sacramento Area Local 522 Firefighters, California Statewide Law Enforcement Association. These are, let's hear it now for all of our sponsors if we could. We would also like to thank our guardian and advocate sponsors. They are recognized on the back of your program this morning. But we begin, as we always do, with the presentation of colors by the Mutual Honor Guard, which is comprised of members from local law enforcement and public safety agencies, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance and the National Anthem. Good morning, everybody. We're going to start off with the Pledge of Allegiance. Before we do that, I want to um, invite Officer Randy Van Dusen up to the stage to help us with that. And I wanted to kind of tell you why we asked Officer Van Dusen and Bodie, come on up, Randy, um, to do this. Um, for those of you that don't know Officer Van Dusen, the reason I asked him was really for both professional and personal reasons. And that is because three years ago, almost to this day, we had an incident that unfolded on the streets of Sacramento, uh, essentially a very violent incident that unfortunately involved uh, the Sacramento Police Department, but it also involved the children of Crocker Riverside School because it all unfolded in front of that school. And ultimately it resulted in um, Randy, Randy's uh, canine, Bodie, being shot. And uh, it's not just professional because it demonstrates the the service that we're here to represent and celebrate today of public service today in our community. But it's also personal because my son Riley was at that school that day. 
and um, it had a traumatic impact. So today I, I consider this to be an intersection of public safety in our schools. Um, but after that event, it's not just the dedication of the police officers from that event that was a, a, a clear demonstration of the work that they do, but Officer Van Dusen took it upon himself to reach out to the children of our, of our community with Bodie and to, um, to heal what happened that day. And so I thank him, as well as all members of public safety today, of what they do, not only to protect us, but on behalf of our community. So I thank Officer Van Dusen for that. And so with that, Officer Van Dusen and Bodie, and by the way, Bodie sired five puppies last week, so I'm glad they're not here today, because they'd be going home with us. But uh, Officer Van Dusen, can you lead us, please, in the pledge? Please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. Salute and pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. And we are a small group from the Sacramento Children's Chorus and we'll be singing the national anthem. Thank you, everyone. You may be seated. Chaplain Mindy Russell will now lead us in the invocation. She is the executive director of the Law Enforcement Chaplaincy Sacramento, where she serves as senior chaplain for virtually every federal, state, local law enforcement agency serving the Sacramento region. She is actively involved in many organizations, including the DA's office, where she continues to be a vital part of the planning, organizing, and of course, a participant in this great breakfast as well. Please give a warm welcome to Mindy Russell. Thank you, sir. Good morning. I love this DA's breakfast. It is truly the day that we can kind of come together take that heavy breath and be able to welcome one another. It's been a tough week for so many of us. And in law, in law enforcement, our families have grieved a lot. Next week, we will go into dis, uh, law enforcement, the national 
memorial as well. But today we can celebrate community and law enforcement, public safety, and how we join together. So would you join me in a word of prayer? Gracious God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to come together and meet old friends and meet new friends and just celebrate. Celebrate this great city that we have, this county that we serve in, and the great citizens and the community members that are also here. We ask the blessing over our public safety, protection in all ways. We ask a blessing over all the businesses that they would prosper in all ways. And we ask the community that they see that they are so important and so vital in keeping this community safe as well. We are the home of the free and the home of the brave. And with that, with that we give you all praise. Amen. Well, God bless you. I'd like to call up to the stage uh, a gentleman who's going to present some information about the Sacramento Police Sheriff Memorial Foundation. <laughs> Dustin Smith, come on up. Dustin is president of the Sacramento Police Officers Association and the Sacramento Police and Sheriff's Memorial Foundation. Let's give Dustin a warm welcome, shall we? Good morning. I'm lucky, if not honored, to be in front of you today on behalf of the Sacramento Police Sheriff Memorial Foundation. For a number of years now, I've had the opportunity to participate in both the local and state ceremony and, and find a new connection with families of the fallen that I never really thought I would have and that I didn't understood and I never really understood what that meant as an individual, but how I can maybe start to learn to pass that on to a group. So this year at the state memorial, or at the local memorial, I set out a challenge, and I know that we were having a little bit of a mic issue, so I wanna, I wanna put that challenge back out to this group today, because I, I don't know if there's a better group to accept this challenge and see if we can start to press this out. The, the families and the stories that are connected to those memorials are still alive and they're still true. The problem is, is that I think this group here hasn't fully accepted the responsibility of passing those stories on. So I want to put out a challenge today to this group to begin that process. It begins with people like me. I've been a training officer for the police department for a number of years. I've now moved into a different role as the president. But as, as an example, that training officer is going to take these stories and they're going to pass it on to their trainees, who then take it to the next generation and so on. So the challenge begins real simply like this. I want each and every person in this room to visit one of the sites. If you're here locally, please visit our local memorial. Go out to the site. It's a beautiful site, a world-class memorial site. I've never seen anything like it at a local memorial anywhere else in the nation as I've traveled, and, and I want to set that challenge to you here locally. If you're not here locally and you're visiting from one of the outside jurisdictions, a different county, something along those lines, I challenge you to go to the state memorial and do this simple thing. Take two names that you're unfamiliar with. Not two names that you know, not, not any fallen brothers or sisters that you've personally been involved with, but two people that you don't know from that memorial now. I want you to take those names back. I want you to learn their stories. Who were they? Who are their families? Where are they now? Where are they living? How can you reconnect with them? How can you connect your department back to that family? Take that challenge and then spread it. Take it to the trainees. Take it back to your community. Spread it to your family. Maybe take your trainee or another coworker out to the site with you. Have them accept that same challenge alongside you. And then we start to pass that message through. And then these stories become a live, just a living part of who we are and how we recognize what we do. Because that great sacrifice that we've seen, whether it was Danny Oliver or Mike Davis here locally this year, is one that it's alive and it's clear and it's current and we know it, but there's many others who aren't as current, who, are, who, are, who those stories are starting to dwindle and we're not necessarily remembering those stories. So please accept this challenge, visit a site, bring those stories back and help keep, help keep the, 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 the courageous moments that took those, those fallen officers from us alive. So thank you for your time today.
Thank you, Dustin. I'd now like to bring back up uh, Mindy Russell, our chaplain, to lead us in the tributes to the fallen officers. Mindy, come on back up. Okay. Anna White here. Do you see it? We have small ones and this size for you all to take for free to put in your house or your business windows so you can show the support that you all have for our law enforcement. You know, this has been a tough week, like I said, and the very first thing I would like to do to honor and give tribute to our two fallen officers on October 24th. I'd like you to stand in honor of them, and we're gonna do a silent moment of silence. End of watch, October 24th, 2014. Deputy Danny P. Oliver, Detective Michael Davis. Would you bow your heads? Thank you, you may be seated. Also, just wanna let you know, they're back. It was for all the demand that you had last year, they're back, the blue ribbons. I just wanted to let you know a little bit about tributes and why it's so important. And thank you, Dustin, for actually starting about the tributes. You're so right. These are not names on a wall. These are men and women. They're moms and dads and sisters and brothers and daughters and sons. These are people that we need to be able to remember and never forget. So these tributes that we've had all week long continue until May 15th. And why is that date so important? In 1962, President John F. Kennedy signed a proclamation which designated May 15th as the Peace Officers Memorial Day. That is the week that is surrounding all the activities back in D.C. We do it the week before, so the fallen officer families that are affected can come to our tributes and then go to D.C. In May, we call this the Law Enforcement Appreciation Month, where tens of thousands of law enforcement officers, their families, and the community participate around the country. There are stunning tributes. There are so many traditions seeped into the ceremonies that you have witnessed. And I hope that if you haven't seen them another time, maybe next May, you go and take time to go to the Police and Sheriff Memorial or maybe go to the California Peace Officers Memorial because it brings such a pride in you. It is true, it is a bittersweet day. It's bitter because it shouldn't have ever have to happen. But it's sweet to know that one day out of the whole year, we recognize the great sacrifices of these men and women. And may I just go to the transition of our fallen officers pay the ultimate sacrifice, but our officers and their families every day make a sacrifice because they're willing to stand in harm's way for you and me. So I would like to let you know that we have a challenge too. I'm pretty fed up, quite frankly. <laughs> Can I do that as a chaplain? <laughs> fed up? <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just done with all the stuff that's gone on in the news against our law enforcement. And I had a little lady come up to me and said, well, you know, my officers know I, I appreciate them. And I said, well, why is that, ma'am? She says, well, because I don't break the law. I said, that's not good enough anymore. Bless your heart. And she goes, well, what do you want me to do? I said, why don't you wave to them? Why don't you walk up to them and say thank you for your, your do, of what you do in our community? Why don't you tell other people how good they are? Because we have stellar law enforcement in our community. And I want you to know, we appreciate you. So for um, the chaplains that are your cheerleaders out there, okay, we want you to know one thing. 
our challenge was we started in January when we had a pro a rally for law enforcement and we're going to do another one in August. We had everybody in the community that we could give the sign to our officers that we appreciate them and this is it. Ready? <laughs> well, you don't have to do this, but this. So, on the count of three, if you're ready for the challenge, are you ready? I want to see this, because that shows we support law enforcement. Ready? One, and two, and three. All right. Did anybody get a picture of that? All right, God bless you all. She is sassy, isn't she? Uh. All righty. It is uh, time to bring up again, and we're very fortunate to have her here. She's going to uh, talk a little bit about our overall theme today, but please give a very warm welcome to our new DA, Anne-Marie Schubert. So good morning again, everybody. Before I kind of talk about what this year's theme is, I just want to take a couple minutes and and, and say thank you um, to everybody that's here. This is my first. Uh, this is my first rodeo, I guess you can say, for this event. Um, I've come to many. Um, it is really, in my, in my humble opinion, it is a great day for Sacramento. It's a day that we come together as a community to celebrate the hard work of our law enforcement, and really also to celebrate the communities that that they serve and that we serve. Um, and with that, um, there's many people in this room. There's elected officials, public safety representatives. Um, I can't spend all day, um, I, if, I, if I did, I'd be here all day to, to acknowledge everybody individually. But, but really, when we talk about the communities that our law enforcement serves, they're really here. They're representative in this room. And so with that, um, every segment of our community is here. Public safety agencies, education and school districts, healthcare, legal, the business community, various associations, community organizations, nonprofits, public service agencies, and our faith-based community. That's a pretty darn good sign of the fact that we're here to represent the community. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the theme for this year. Um, you'll see on your pamphlet that this year's theme is a community call to action for the safety of our children. And some of you might wonder, what does that mean? What, how do we come about this theme for this year? And um, it came really as a result of, uh, before I had the fortune of winning this election, I um, had the fortune of supervising our child abuse unit in the DA's office. And um, quite honestly, there's, there's some pretty despicable things that happen in this world to the children of our community. And this year's theme came out of what I would say are real life case, case examples that um, we see in law enforcement really on an everyday basis. And so as a result of kind of seeing what, what I saw in, in our filing of cases, I felt that this was an important theme um, that we come together as a community and not just police and prosecutors, but really the diverse community to protect our children. And um, so when we put this program together, I was asked, who do you want to sit at your table with you? And I really tried to pick individuals that I think were part of this theme. So Sheila Boxley, who's Child Abuse Prevention Council, Mark Klass, who's our keynote speaker, Natalia Luna, who's the head of our government and uh, community relations division. And then I have to give my special shout out to my teachers from um, my old days. I'm not going to date myself here, but my high school teachers. Um, and um, because they had a tremendous impact on me. Um, Officer Van Dusen, who we've talked about, his great work for us, and my son Riley. And um, so the theme this year is a little bit different. It, it's, it's about how can we come together as a community in a world that has changed dramatically in the last 10 years. Uh, and this year, it's about how can we prevent crime on the front end when we're talking about the dangers of social media. Um, the internet is a wonderful thing, but it has created um, circumstances that have created significant challenges 
for the children of our community. Um, there's, a t there's a new TV show right now uh, that just came out. It's, it's a spin-off of CSI, and it's called CSI Cyber. And there's an FBI agent on that, that uh, show, and she has a tagline, and this is the way her tagline is. I work with crimes that start in the mind, that live online, and play out in the real world. And it really is a, a, a very telling thing of really what we live in today in a, in a digital world. And it has a tremendous impact on the children of our community. And um, I think 20 years ago, many of us used to worry about who the person was at the park and how can we protect our children. And now it's who's the person behind the computer terminal. And as a parent and as a prosecutor, um, it changes every day, and I feel very um, passionate about the fact that it's our responsibility as a community, not just as police and prosecutors, but as a community to, re to, to collaborate together. Part of the reason that we reached out specifically this year to school districts is because we want, we want to engage the schools in this fight, I call it fight crime and invest in kids, um, to prevent this stuff on the front end, not just prevent victimization of our children, but also prevent kids from becoming offenders through the use of online uh, social media. So that's the reason for our theme this year. Um, and so with that, with that theme, we put together a short video to kind of explain a collaborative video, what is this idea and what can we do as a community? So I ask you just to take a couple minutes and watch this short video. We are living in a digital age that affects every aspect of our everyday lives. The internet has opened up and expanded our physical world to the virtual world. This has presented unique challenges, dangers, and threats, particularly as it relates to our children at home, at school, and in their everyday lives. There are many individuals and organizations like mine that work tirelessly to try to prevent child abuse and neglect. We're able to be effective most of the time when we have the resources to help children and families because we know that most of the perpetrators of physical, emotional, and sexual abuse are people well known to children. That's not necessarily the case when we talk about internet crimes against children. In that case, perfect strangers can come into the homes and the lives of children and have a very serious impact. And it's been my experience that often children are much more tech savvy than their parents. So some of that monitoring is very difficult for parents. And we're working as are others to try to educate parents in how they can protect their children. It's a whole new world out there in the schools. It used to be that bullying was out in the open. Kids picked on each other in the playground, had fights, but now there's cyberbullying. Kids are hiding on the internet, tormenting and victimizing other kids. So what do we need to do about this? Number one, we've got to educate parents. Number two, we've got to get parents to talk to their kids about this issue. They need to share the dangers of cyberbullying. The attacks on children have been devastating, leading some even to, to suicide. We've got to encourage parents and their kids to report incidents of cyberbullying to law enforcement. This is all of our problem. Our whole community needs to pull together to let cyberbullies know we're not going to let them keep hiding on the internet and victimizing our kids. The Sacramento Sheriff's Department is one of five regional task force in California that receives cyber tips from the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children. What types of crimes are we seeing? We have sexting, where we've got a child versus child or child versus adult sending sexually explicit images or content to one another. Then we have sextortion, where a child will send a partially nude photograph to a suspect. The suspect will ask for more photographs, and if the child declines, the suspect will send any images that the child already took to all of their friends on Facebook, possibly causing potential suicide. A lot of our teenagers, they themselves are becoming suspects, possibly by receiving images from their girlfriend, sending them to a friend of a friend, or posting them onto fake social media accounts. 
The Sacramento Sheriff's Department, along with the Sacramento District Attorney's Office, we need to work together to educate our communities, our families, our parents, our teachers, and our children with age-appropriate material. And as they get older, we need to continue to give them more information. Over the last several years, the District Attorney's Office has seen an explosion of cases involving the internet. They range from such things as child abuse, gang activity, human trafficking, and even murder cases. Kids are not just victims of crime through the use of the internet, but we're also seeing children becoming offenders through the use of the internet and entering the juvenile justice system as a result of using things that are associated with social media. My name is Mark Klass and I'm the president of the Class Kids Foundation. Uh, the Class Kids Foundation was founded in the aftermath of the kidnap and murder of my 12-year-old daughter, Polly Class. I'm very proud of the work that the Class Kids Foundation has done, but nothing that we've accomplished has ever been accomplished in a vacuum. We need really good cops on the street and cops online that are able to do the investigative work to be able to bring these individuals uh, in. We need great prosecutors that understand that people that say they're going to cause harm to children very likely will cause harm to children, and if they haven't already, they have to be dealt with in an effective way. We need corrections departments that are going to ensure that these individuals uh, stay in prison where they belong, and we need government officials to support these kinds of policies. So really, we need a, a, an approach that's going to include kids, their families, their communities, their infrastructure, their law enforcement, their prosecutors, their elected officials, and I think that's how we have to address this problem. I hope today starts a conversation and future partnerships so that we can work together to protect our children from the dangers that they face from the internet and social media. So with that in mind, um, this year we asked Mark Class to be our keynote speaker. And um, everybody knows uh, what happened to Mark in his life and his daughter Polly. Um, but what Mark did really over 20 years ago from the time that terrible th situation occurred was he gave up his career, his lucrative career, and in my opinion to be one of the most nationally recognized child advocates in this country on behalf of children. And um, I consider him a friend. I've known him now for a few years. We've worked on other public safety issues together. And um, the thing about Mark Class that I have such tremendous respect for is despite um, the loss of his daughter, he has, um, he's taken upon himself to make it a mission. He is a singular vision individual. And that is to do everything he can to protect the children of this community. And I think one of the best organizations that he um, represents that is, and I'm so proud to be part of, is an, is an organization that's called Fight Crime and Invest in Kids. And it's essentially um, a nonprofit that seeks to um, have policies and laws that prevent child abuse on the front end, um, but in the event that something of that nature does occur, to have very st strict and swift justice for those individuals. Um, He's, um, he's one of, not only a personal friend, but he's also a Facebook friend. And um, there isn't a day that goes by that when I settle down at night and look at my Facebook, um, that Mark hasn't posted something. It's never anything personal in terms of his own personal life. It is always about the children of this community and across the state and across this country. And, and um, some of it's tragic that he posts, but some of it has tremendous optimism about how we can come to bed together as a community um, to intervene in children's lives. So I'm honored to have him today as our keynote speaker. So with that, Mark Class. Yes, good morning, everybody. Um, and isn't she great? I mean, wow, she had such big, big 
choose to fill, and, and she's done such a tremendous job. To have one great DA follow another great, great DA is, is, is uh, I, I think, an anomaly in, in our society. But boy, did you guys score here in Sacramento. So just a, 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 a shout out to, to Anne Marie. She's fantastic. Um, I'd like to correct something that she said, though, very quickly first. She said that, that I've followed a singular vision. It's not a singular vision. And any of the work that I've done has been in collaboration with a lot of people, and I'll be talking about that. But more than anybody else, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing without the support of my wife, and I'll tell you why. We, uh, I remember the precise moment that I, I decided I needed to pursue a career as a child safety advocate. And it, it wasn't the day that Polly was kidnapped, which was October 1st, 1993. And we were informed about that very late at night. It was about 10.30 in the evening. Um, and we went to Petaluma. The first thing we were told is, don't go to Petaluma. We live in Sausalito. Don't go to Petaluma because the police don't want a distraught father trampling evidence. Well, it turned out the police never said that. That was somebody taking it upon themselves. But we went to Petaluma the next day, and then the next 65 days were really, were really guided by fear of what had happened to our daughter, hope that we might be able to find her, anger over the fact that every day went by and we weren't able to bring her home, and then just the total desperation that exists in trying to find somebody um, when you're really looking for a needle in a haystack. And after, the day after Polly uh, had been found, Violet and I returned to our home in Sausalito for the first time in over two months. And uh, you could imagine the despair that we were in. It was just such a horrible thing. We were so sad. We really didn't want to live. We took a walk and I said to her, I think I'm pretty good at this, and I'm going to continue advocating or start advocating for other kids as we advocated for Polly if I have to do it out of a cardboard box on the side of a railroad tra track. And she said, you do what you have to do, I'll keep working, we'll find a way to move forward, and we'll try to make a change in the world. And we felt we had a very, very limited window of opportunity. We really felt we had about 90 days. So from that moment on, we've been more than my beautiful wife. I mean, she's been my great partner. And, and anything that I do is certainly backed by the hard work that she does, detailing everything that needs to be done, organizing everything, making sure that I got up here making sure that I woke up this morning and found myself in front of this podium. So, you know, I, I, thank you, Anne Marie, for saying those nice things about me, but there's no me. It's, it's really in us, and it always has been, and it always will be. So we felt that we had this very short window of opportunity, and we knew that we had to do something, and we didn't quite know what to do. We didn't want to do a TV movie. We rejected those ideas. We rejected the book ideas because we thought, you know, in three months there's going to be another crime, another crime du jour. People will start paying attention to that, and we'll lose our opportunity. And in fact, not long afterwards, O.J. Simpson, uh, I'm sorry, um, Nicole Brown was murdered by an unknown assailant, and uh, that really sort of dominated the news cycle for a number of years. And hopefully OJ will get out of prison and he'll be able to get back onto the golf course and find out who actually did commit that crime. But, you know, before Polly was kidnapped, we thought she would be okay. I mean, we'd had the talk. We talked to her about stranger danger. But we found out afterwards that, that the evidence doesn't support that idea of stranger danger. So there really wasn't anything out there going on to protect children. There weren't any protocols for law enforcement. Um, there weren't any good ideas for parents to talk to their kids about. It was still, people were talking about stranger danger, stranger danger. Well, you know what, Polly was kidnapped by a stranger, but it wasn't some guy that she talked to. It was some creep that had just gotten out of prison for his second kidnapping, who had been rehabilitated while he was in the joint, and who three months later decided that he would avoid AIDS by getting a young one. So what do you have? You have a psychopath who, who's, whose definition of safe sex is to kidnap, 
rape and murder a 12-year-old girl. Well, there's something well beyond stranger danger going on there. So we started looking into it. And what we found is that one in five girls and one in 20 boys is a victim of child sexual abuse. Over the course of their lifetime, 28% of US youths aged 14 to 17 had been and probably will continue to be sexually victimized. The children most vulnerable to child sexual abuse are girls between the ages of seven and 13 years old. Um, the typical offender is male, begins molesting by age 15, engages in a variety of deviant behavior, and molests an average of 117 youngsters, most of whom do not report the offense. This tells you, you know, that, that there's a, a, a very deep problem going on here. Now, I could go on and on and on with statistics, but I'm sure that most of you in this room are much better versed in statistics than I am. But there is one other statistic that I'd like to share with you, and I'm going to share it with you at the end of my talk. And I'm going to wait until then because it's, it's so important. It, it, it's a statistic that, that tells me very clearly that we can cut predatory abduction in the United States of America by one third. And we can do that without new technologies, we can do that without some miracle product that's going to cost anybody a whole bunch of money. Uh, we can do that without engaging uh, new forms of social networking. Um, but I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself and I, I will move on and hopefully I'll remember at the end to share that because it, it's really cool stuff. The first thing that we did after rejecting the ideas of movies and books and, and edutainment um, types of options is we dove right into legislation. We got involved in things like truth and sentencing. Um, we got involved in President Clinton's, um, President Clinton's crime bill, which put 100,000 cops on the streets, which promoted truth and sentencing, which put a bunch of money um, on the street for prevention funding for at-risk use, sort of a precursor to the fight crime and invest in kids issue. Uh, we ultimately got involved in uh, Mike Reynolds' fantastic three strikes in your outlaw after some initial hesitation, but it was actually after we saw that it was working incredibly well that I called Mike and I said, man, you were right. Everything you said was right. Crime has been cut tremendously in this state. We got behind the uh, California's one strike law for sexual perverts, predators, and we got behind things like Megan's law and ultimately things like the Amber Alert, Le Amber Alert legislation that in and of itself helped cut crime in the United States by 50% within only a very few years. It was absolutely extraordinary. Pauly was kidnapped in the middle of the worst crime um, outbreak in the United States history and within just about five or six years it had been cut completely in half. Unfortunately, now we're seeing all of this good work undone. It's absolutely unreal. If it's not AB 109 or Senate Bill 9 or Proposition 36 or Proposition 47, it's the piecemeal release of lifers because they're supposedly aged out. Um, and it breaks my heart. It breaks my heart to see Hillary Clinton come out and denounce the policies that her husband put in place, which were so integral in creating the safe environment that we live in now, and then having him follow up by saying, oh yeah, I think it's really a good idea what Hillary's doing. We overreached during that time. Well, I think people forget. I think they absolutely forget what we were going through, and I, 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 I pray that we don't have to go through it again. I pray that in 21 years there's not some other father like myself standing here saying, we did this, we did this, we did this, and then it all unraveled once again. So the pendulum swings and the pendulum swings back. But there's one thing that has been consistent, and, and Anne-Marie touched upon it. It's this organization called Fight Crime Invest in Kids. It's police chiefs, it's prosecutors, and it's crime victims, all working towards creating and creating legislation and finding funding for kids who are in need, kids who otherwise wouldn't have a second chance, the front end approach. Suggesting that we can cut crime in the United States by building more prisons is like saying that you can cure AIDS by building more, well, you can cure AIDS by building more cemeteries. It doesn't work that way. You need front end approaches. So when we started with fight crime back in 2000, in 2000, there was federal funding for about 
10,000 kids for after school programs, for uh, Head Start programs, for things like that. Now the funding exists for over a million kids on the federal level and the states are stepping up. The amazing thing is, is that this is one arena where the Democrats and the Republicans actually agree. I mean, there's very small differences, but you can go into any one of those legislative offices, make the case for, for, for prevention funding for kids, and they'll go, yeah, I get it. I understand that. I mean, it's, it's, it's a huge step forward. It, it's, we're so far advanced in that arena than we had been that it's, uh, it's, it, it, gives me, it gives me great hope for the future. The next thing we did is we looked at community-based solutions. And, and uh, again, the, none of these were our ideas, not at, not at that time. And police chiefs and sheriffs were telling us one thing, that one of the most effective crime-fighting weapons out there is a good neighborhood watch program. Well, who'd have thunk it? I mean, really, who'd have thought something like that to just people organizing on their block and assigning block captains and finding ways to look after each other's property and look after each other's children would be a great crime-fighting deterrent. But you could see every place in America where you had an effective crime, an effective neighborhood watch program, you would have lower crime rates. So it was an idea that we adopted. But again, it's an idea of collaboration because the police chiefs or the sheriffs have to come into the neighborhood and they have to instruct, they have to help organize, they have to tell them what you do and how you do it. And you know, once those goals have been accomplished and people take it seriously, they can make great, great changes within their own communities. Now, there are some apps. <laughs> there are some apps and, and there are some online resources uh, to enhance the Neighborhood Watch program. Uh, Next Door comes to mind. Um, another one that is, uh, that's very popular is iNeighbor.org. Um, and they're both structured to enhance the Neighborhood Watch concept. I joined our local next door group just to see what kind of stuff is going on in there in that forum. And you know what? There's a lot of gossip. There's always a lot of gossip in life. It's absolutely unbelievable. But you, once you move all that stuff out of the way, there are some people talking about some really serious issues. Uh, suspicious vehicles that might be lurking in the neighborhood or suspicious people that might be in the neighborhood. Or even the multi-use paths, finding ways for people to be able to walk the path while somebody is biking the path. And I do a lot of biking myself. So I'm on the, the multi-use paths in our neighborhood quite often on my bicycle, um, but I do it on the weekdays because there's very few people out there. On the weekends, you have these, I call them bike Nazis. I mean, they, you have these groups of like 15 or 20 guys that just take over the road and just move forward at about 20 miles an hour, and, and boy, you get in their way, and, and you, you, know, you better start praying now. Find, Mid, find Mindy because you're going to need her. Um, but then there's other kinds of community-based solutions that I'd like to mention very quickly. Uh, businesses that give time off for their employees so that they can volunteer within their community um, is, is a, a very successful program because it brings business into the community much more than they otherwise would be. It gives them an opportunity to give back to their community. Uh, fraternal organizations like Rotary or Kiwanis that, that, very well, that do very well bring uh, children as a number one priority in the programs that they develop for their local chapters and for their national chapters. I mean, it's, it's really a good thing to see and they take these kinds of things very, very seriously. Um, and then churches, I mean churches, the faith-based community is, is, is huge in child protection in this country because obviously they give them a good moral grounding, they give them an ethical grounding, and they do reach out to the community. They, they feed the homeless, they find ways to, to give back to those that have given to them. Um, one of the things that we did is we quickly developed an outreach program called the Printathon. And with the Printathon, we use computerized equipment. And we use it to fingerprint and photograph kids. And that's kind of a ploy. I mean, what are you going to do with a kid's fingerprint, really? Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever been able to use that in an investigation. I, I think it would be hard pressed to find a scenario where uh, a missing child will be located through the use of a fingerprint, but it gives us the ability to bring parents in so that we can share good information with them, something beyond stranger danger. Because we think that, you know, kids need to learn. I mean, Riley probably knows more than 
probably 99% of the kids in America simply because of, of his connection to, to his mother. Wake up, Riley. <laughs> um, but, you know, <clears throat> again, we, we, uh, we've fingerprinted and photographed more than a million kids in America, and we've been to like 45 states, I think, uh, fingerprinted and photographed more than a million kids. We've never databased any of the information, and we've done it without ever charging a family for the service. We find community-minded sponsors that are willing to underwrite the program and then promote the program in their own communities so that we can come in and, and offer this service free to families. In fact, uh, tomorrow, Violet and I are headed up to Grass Valley to do like our seventh or eighth <clears throat> annual print-a-thon with a, a, a local security dealer there called Beam Security. Um, and we, we love these people and we love <clears throat> the opportunity to be able to do that. Um, and then, you know, and I'm preaching to the choir here. I mean, the law enforcement community, when we started back in 1993, didn't even have a protocol for missing kids. You realize that every time a child disappeared, they would have to reinvent that wheel. And boy, were kids disappearing in San Francisco, were kids disappearing in Northern California. There was a period of time there where there were three very high profile cases in the Bay Area within like a six month period. And I'll tell you what, man, as the father of a young daughter, it was freaking me out, just like it was freaking everybody else out. Because we'd turn on the evening news and there'd be a teary eyed parent saying, I'll never give up hope and I'll never leave my telephone because I'm waiting for that ransom call to come in. Well, you know what, within a couple of days, that story would, would, would devolve. Um, it would no longer be on the lead the 11 o'clock news. It would no longer be on the top above the fold in the newspaper, old media, for those who don't know. Um, and ultimately, it would, it would just disappear until the next one came along. And it happened time after time after time. And as parents, we'd freak out for a little bit, then we'd forget, or we'd tell our kids, remember, whatever you do, don't talk to strangers, and then we'd forget. So the information that we provide at these printathons is, is pretty simple. And this is information that can be used online in, in certain ways as well as offline. We, we tell kids that they should always check with their parents first. And we know not every child lives in an ideal situation, that there's not always going to be a mom there or a dad there. And oftentimes, kids are being raised by grandparents and or uh, kids are living in foster situations. But they need to tell the responsible adult where they're going to be, and they should always be with somebody. Um, it just makes sense. There's strength in numbers. And we also tell, tell them that if, if they should trust their feelings that if something doesn't feel right, it probably isn't right. And then you need to put distance between yourself and whatever is making you feel bad. And we tell them that, that not all strangers are bad people, that if a kid feels threatened, he can walk up to a woman, and that woman will try to help him out of a dangerous, him or her out of a dangerous situation. They can go up to other kids. Other kids will try to help them out of dangerous situations. They can go to retail clerks in a retail situation or security guards. They could even go, quite frankly, and this is the truth, a kid could go up to 99% of, of all men and they would put their life down for them. There's no doubt in my mind. Unfortunately, men are the problem. And who knows who that 1% is? You know, you think it's the guy in the trench coat that looks like Chester the molester. But as we all know, it could be absolutely anybody. It could be, say, a school teacher. It could be a coach. We see these in the headlines all the time. It could be a member of the clergy. It could be just some guy walking down the street. I don't know if any of you saw this, <clears throat> but just yesterday, there was some amazing video that came out of the Bay Area. And it even looks like it's in high def. And what it does is it shows a 13-year-old girl walking. And I'm suspecting that she's probably walking home from school because she has her backpack. And there's a man following her. Well, he looks like a respectable guy, and that's what she said. He just seemed like a normal Joe. So she didn't pay a lot of attention to him. And she walked to her house, and he followed her into her house. He pushed his way right into this little girl's house. And you know what she did? She fought him off. It doesn't look like she did a terribly effective job at fighting him off because she fell to the ground. He was much bigger than she was, but whatever she did, it was enough to force him out of the door. 
This is a little girl, and I think this is one of the most empowering videos I've ever seen in my life. Because this is a slight little girl that finds a way to fight back and quite probably save her own life against somebody much stronger and somebody much more determined. And I hope every kid in America looks at this video and says, if that little girl can fight back, I can fight back too. Because you know what? Far too many kids, including my own daughter, went with the perp when they shouldn't have. They should never go. They should do whatever they can do to stay at the point of contact. Don't be marginalized more than you're already marginalized, because if you are, it could very well be the end. So go online. It's, on, it's everywhere. It's on Facebook. It's everywhere. And uh, you'll see this video of this kid if you haven't done that already. But, you know, <clears throat> cops have things that they didn't have before. Uh, they have protocols now. You know, the very first missing child protocol was written in the aftermath of Pauli's uh, tragedy. It was written by the FBI because there was so much good cooperation between the FBI and the Petaluma PD during that investigation, something that we were unaware of, um, but it, it did happen. Um, so there's interactive databases that cross jurisdictional lines. There's software solutions to prioritize the elements of an investigation. Surveillance cameras, what a great thing surveillance cameras are. And I know a lot of people don't like them, but personally, I think they're absolutely amazing because we can see what's actually going on in our communities. There's no question that children still face dangers on the street. We hear the headlines every day. A child is snatched, an amber alert is issued, an investigation is launched, sex offender registrations are searched, and surveillance cameras are monitored. Our understanding of street safety has been heightened in the past 20 years to the point that we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time a child disappears, and we don't automatically categorize every missing child as a runaway. You know, my daughter was the very first missing child on the internet. Um, I didn't even know what the internet was then. I had to have somebody explain it to me. What is this thing that you're talking about that you're going to post Polly's flyer on? And they explained, and that was the beginning of a revolution as far as kids and the internet goes. Uh, the good side of it, unfortunately, <clears throat> there's a really dark side, and it's something that, um, that Anne Marie has touched on. It's something I think that everybody in this room is totally and completely aware of, and it's something that really has caught us off guard. Because while everybody else was using the internet to, to, to acquire knowledge, um, to visit museums uh, virtually, uh, to, to do research, to do the good things we had to do with the internet, there was a small subset. And back in the day, kids had to be aware of predators lurking in alleys, dark stairwells and in and around schoolyards. Those concerns still exist, but the internet has emboldened a new generation of cyber perverts who rely upon anonymity and subterfuge to engage their evil intention. Now, while the vast majority of people were marveling at the potentials and benefits of the, of the internet, this small subset of individuals were pursuing the dark side of cyberspace. They were networking with each other and empowering amoral behavior. They were reinvigorating the near dormant child pornography industry and lurking behind false profiles as they attempted to lure, groom, and victimize our children. So the kids don't know these people, as has been pointed out, but they do spend time grooming these kids. They find vulnerable kids, kids that aren't getting what they need at home, uh, that maybe don't have friends, and, and all of a sudden, in, anonymously, they understand them. Um, and they talk to them, and they become more and more familiar with them. And ultimately, they'll try to set up an, anom an anonymous meeting with them, and that's where the real problems begin. The very predators who could not penetrate our deadbolts, alarm systems, guard dogs, or personal armories have found a backyard back alley into our living rooms under the camouflage of binary code and new world technology. The problem has become so alarming that an instant message stating that I am a 12 year old boy home alone and I want to have sex with you is enough to launch and deliver a convoy of white and blue collar pedophiles willing to risk anything and everything to satisfy their uncontrollable urges. While we basked in a false sense of security, our children's bedrooms 
became the predator's new playground. I'm sure you've all seen the Dateline programs that they used to do to catch a predator. It was absolutely extraordinary. You couldn't stem that tide of, of, of cyber perverts. I mean, they were almost like in convoys coming to these houses. There were points where the host of that show had to juggle two guys in, in different parts of the house at the same time. They were coming in such huge numbers. Many of those resulted in, 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 uh, in prosecutions. The, the show died in infamy, unfortunately, because it led to a very unfortunate in this, uh, incident. But I think that it did a tremendous service to society by pointing out those inherent dangers of the internet to all of us. Now, how do we combat internet crimes against children? I guess that then becomes a big question. Uh, they used to say, place the home computer in a common area and modern monitor your kids' online activities. The problem with that is that probably every kid in America now has a laptop, they have a tablet, they have a smartphone, their friends have all of those things, they have libraries they can visit that are online, they can go to their friends' houses, they're all online, in school they're online. There's no way that you can monitor your kids' activities online, really. Uh, even the, the net nanny, softwares that, that purport to assist you in doing that don't really do that good a job. It really comes down to being able to educate your kids, talk to your kids, have an ongoing conversation with your kids, and make sure that they understand that the dangers that they face on the street are the very same dangers that they're facing online. We need to stay on top of social media. How do you do that? I mean, I'm sure everybody here has got uh, access and, and uses to some level, either professionally or per personally. And I'm going to start posting my dinner menus now, and Marie, I thought, so I can be more mundane online, I guess, um, professionally or personally. And and uh, we're all on Twitter, we're 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 on Facebook, but you know what? There's a uh, kids abandon those those social media sites long ago. Now there's an organization that does a very good job of, of monitoring what kids are doing online and where they're going. It's called Common Sense Media. It's commonsensemedia.org and you can go on to Common Sense Media to find out what kids are doing and where they're going and learn a little bit about these apps because they come and they go very quickly but they're ubiquitous. There was a case a couple of years ago of a little girl who's mother and brother were murdered and she was then kidnapped by this lunatic. Um, she was fortunately rescued in the mountains of Utah by a crack FBI team and the first thing she did when she got home after they murdered the perp was go online and start sharing information with her friends. And people were like, whoa, what's wrong with this little girl? She must have been complicit in her own kidnapping. There's something, you know, amoral and antisocial about the way she's doing things. Well, you know what, this is how they grow up now. They grow up online. They're there all the time. They know what they're doing, and they're going to continue doing it. Now, before I go, I need to bring up this issue of cyberbullying. This is absolutely unbelievable. It's bullying. Cyberbullying is bullying that takes place using electronic technology. One thing we know about the World Wide Web is it is as permanent as it is anonymous. Anything posted can be there forever. You can't put that genie back in the bottle. Cyberbullying can be anonymous, as anonymous as it is 24-7. There are many instances of deaths as a result of cyberbullying. Um, Tyler Clementi, the student out of New York, is one that comes to mind. Audrey, P Audrey Potts in the Bay Area is another heartbreaking instance of somebody that was just bullied into their own death. We need to be vigilant and we need education if we're going to be able to overcome this cyberbullying trend that we're seeing now. Now, I know that I've got just a couple of minutes left. At the beginning of this talk, I told you that I had another statistic that I think we can use to cut predatory abduction in this country by a third. And this is it, in a nutshell. It turns out that one third of all predatory abductions in the United States of America occur to children headed to school in the morning or coming home from school in the afternoon. That's extraordinary. That's extraordinary. And here's how I think we can cut this. First of all, we tell this information to our kids. You need to be particularly vigilant going to school and coming home from school because oftentimes you're by yourself. Oftentimes your mind is not on your surrounding. It's either on your schoolwork or on your friends or on something else. Um, 
These people may be lurking, they know your patterns, they may be laying in wait. What we can do as a society beyond talking to our kids is we can set up surveillance. We can do high, high tech surveillance with cameras, things like that, or we can do neighborhood watch surveillance. We know that these kids are vulnerable the, during these times, so let's have a neighborhood watch program deal with that. Or let's have an, an, uh, uh, an assisted living facility full of old folks who may not have a lot to do. Let them take on that job or have the faith-based community take on that job. Do something to make sure that we're monitoring our kids as they go to and from school. If a third of the kids are going down that way, we can stop that. We can stop that by working together in collaboration with our neighbors, with our cops, with our prosecutors, with our lawmakers, with our faith-based community, with our NPOs. I haven't mentioned NPOs. NPOs are awesome. My goodness gracious. <laughs> There's so many great NPOs out there doing God's work, and they're doing it for little fanfare and even less money. So, ladies and gentlemen, we can change this world, but we can't change it by ourselves. What we have to do is we have to find common problems, common themes. We have to link our arms. We have to work to together towards eradicating the problems that are in our society. And if we do that together, we can change the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark Class. Always a great reminder, especially I've got four kids under the roof at home still, and I'm one of those dads who tries, who checks the history on, on the computers, who, you know, who, who gets on, tries to get on every social media site the kids are on, and still I just feel like my efforts are woefully inadequate. Uh, just that constant nagging that I'm not doing enough, should be doing more, and thanks to organizations like yours, Mark, I know. Uh, I'll learn to do more. It was brought home to me last Saturday night. I came home from a charitable golf tournament, and my son is sitting there on his laptop. I said, what are you watching? He said, the fight. He said, I can't believe people are paying for this fight, Dad. <laughs> what are you watching? <laughs> anyway. All right. <laughs> Continuing our recognition of extraordinary public service and public safety service. I want to introduce the Rotary Club president of the Sacramento Rotary, Susan Sheridan. She is going to present the Service Above Self Award. Please welcome Susan. Thank you, Kelly, and good morning. Um, as Kelly introduced me, I'm Susan Sheridan, the president of the Rotary Club of Sacramento. Uh, Rotary is an international humanitarian service organization with 34,000 clubs in over 200 countries, and we have over 1.2 million members. Our motto, the Rotary motto, is service above self. Each year, the Rotary Club of Sacramento selects an individual from our community that exemplifies our motto of service above self, and it is my honor to present the award uh, this year. So often in the line of duty, our law enforcement personnel make sacrifices, life and death decisions each day. But what, what do they do on their own time, on their downtime, when they're not on the job? Do they continue to serve selfish, selflessly on a regular day off or on a family outing? Sergeant Dave Gutierrez has been nominated by the Citrus Heights Police Department for the 2015 Service Above Self Award with regard to how he serves on his time off. Before you hear about Sergeant Gutierrez and his dedication, please know that he did not disclose this information to department personnel. He simply lives his belief in doing the right thing and does so without any need for recognition. There are three significant life-saving incidents that have occurred where Sergeant Gutierrez had single-handedly rescued people from three different accidents that he came upon while off-duty and on outings with his family. His ability to act quickly saved lives and is exceptional and worthy of recognition. The first incident in 2009, Dave along with his wife, daughter, and new baby were headed out for a family gathering. They were driving on Grant Line Road, and it was a bright and sunny morning. And this two-lane road was full of traffic. 
Without any warning, an oncoming car made an abrupt U-turn in the middle of the road. Apparently, due to the bright sun, the driver could not see the truck that she turned directly in front of. The truck had no time to stop and slammed right into the car, pushing it off the highway. Dave and his family were in the car behind the truck and witnessed the entire event. Dave quickly went into action, grabbed his first aid kit, and ran to the car. Inside, he saw two children and a woman. The smaller child was a girl about two years old. She was screaming, and her brother, a little boy about seven, was dazed. The mother was pinned in the front seat and bleeding profusely from her head. After quickly assessing the situation, Dave knew he had to tend to the little girl first. He saw that the car door was smashed in and had pinned her hand between her car seat and the smashed door. He was able to forcefully pull the door open, free her hand, and get her out of her car seat. She was covered in glass shards. The little boy had been hit by an additional car seat that was in the car but not buckled in. Dave was able to get the boy out and lay him down. Dave's wife, JJ, called 911 and emergency workers were on their way immediately. Dave is the first to run into a situation that most people wouldn't or couldn't. He puts aside his own concerns to care for the immediate needs of others and even when his family could be at risk. The second incident in 2011 occurred on yet another family outing when Dave and his wife were on their way with their children to see Disney on ice. They were traveling on Highway 50 when all of a sudden, right in front of them, a giant modular home being pulled by the, a truck tipped over sideways, skidded across the road and off to the side of the highway. The truck landed upside down and was badly smashed. Immediately, Dave pulled over and ran to the truck to help. <clears throat> As the truck started to spark flames, Dave kicked open the smashed passenger door to find a woman upside down with a huge gash on her head. He quickly pulled her to safely, safety while another party who witnessed the crash grabbed a fire extinguisher and put out the fire. Again, with Dave's training and expertise, he addressed the injuries while again his wife called 911. As soon as help arrived, Dave provided his contact information, jumped back in the car and continued their drive to Disney on Ice, and they were only a few minutes late. The last incident occurred in 2014 when Dave, his wife, and five-year-old daughter were driving to McLeod, California on Highway 89, which is a very dark and winding two-lane highway. They came across <clears throat> a lot of branches and brush in the road and both thought they saw a black SUV crashed into a tree on the other side of the road. Not sure, Dave made a quick U-turn to go back to the SUV. As they approached the vehicle, it was dark and very quiet, which caused him concern. Was anyone in there alive? He jumped into action and uh, ran to the vehicle. He, both he and his wife saw sparks coming from the engine, and again, his wife called 911. As Dave approached the SUV, another ca car came by, and in trying to swerve uh, from the branches in the road, almost hit him. Fearing those branches might cause a second colli collision, Dave cleared the branches from the highway and flagged down a passing motorist. He then ran back to the car, maneuvered the woman's badly broken pinned leg from under the dashboard, and unbuckled her tangled seat belt. Aware that she was going into shock, uh, Dave diverted the woman's gaze from the small fire that had begun in the engine compartment and directed her to focus on his face and his eyes. Knowing he had very little time before the car would be fully engulfed in flames, he pulled her free from the wreckage through the passenger side window. As he carried her away from the SUV, a deafening explosion filled the night as the SUV went up in flames. Dave laid the woman down on the side of the highway, all the time reassuring her and insisting that she focus on him. That woman is alive today because of Dave's heroic actions that night. Later she said, quote, there are no words to adequately express my full appreciation. He was a calm and reassuring angel sent from above. My whole world was wrapped up in his eyes. I will never forget him, end quote. <clears throat> That woman would have burned to death if Dave and his family had not driven down the road that day and if Dave hadn't responded with courage and bravery. He is a true hero, both on and off duty, and is willing to risk his life to save another. The details of this nomination were provided by Dave's very proud wife, J.J. Gutierrez. J.J., please stand.
JJ knows firsthand that her husband is a hero. The nomination in this write-up about Dave was provided by Sandy Maravillo of the Citrus Heights Police Department. Sandy, please st stand. Well, service above self. Dave doesn't hesitate to think about the danger involved, but only quickly acts to help others. As his wife, JJ is very proud and honored to have him as her husband. She jokes that when they pack the family outings, pack the car for the family outings now, they always stock it with first aid supplies and she makes sure her cell phone is always charged. <laughs> it is my honor to present the Service Above Self Award to Sergeant Dave Gutierrez. He represents humility, understands personal sacrifice, knows that his purpose is to assist others and never hesitates to help when the need arises. I'm sure we all hope that Dave is somewhere on the same roadway whenever we need help. <laughs> Sergeant Dave Gutierrez, please come forward and accept a plaque in your honor and a check for $1,000. Thank you very much, Sergeant Gutierrez, and thank you to all in, in this room for your service. Thank you very much. Great story. Okay, thank, congratulations, Dave. And um, we only have one more award to go. That is the Outstanding Citizen of the Year Awards. And Anne Marie is going to do the honors, and we're going to, and she's going to wrap things up. So I just want to say thank you for, for uh, having me here today. And um, I, last night I uh, was I emceed the Cristo Rey uh, scholarship dinner, um, which was terrific. They moved into a new campus, and I got to interview one of the kids named Elliot, Elliot Marquez. And Elliot is the first Cristo Rey grad to graduate from Sac State this month, and he is going on to grad school. And he said. When I grew up, he said, my father never went to high school. And he said, I didn't know what college was or grad school. And to think that now I am leaving Sac State and going directly to grad school. And I said, what's the dream? He said, I'm going into law enforcement. And uh, it, it astounds me, and I am so grateful for the caliber of men and women who continue to work to protect our community. So thank you very, very much. Anne Marie, come on up. I just want to end this note on um, an event that we had a couple weeks ago at our office and most of you in this room that are members of law enforcement know about it. It's the Outstanding Citizens Award and um, this year we recognized individuals um, that have demonstrated outstanding courage and um, some of them were going to be here today. They, they, didn't, they weren't able to make it but I want to recognize them. If, if you've never been to the Outstanding Citizens Award that our office has hosted for I think close to 15 years now, I would recommend that you, that you go. Um, it, it's really an awe-inspiring event. Even for those of us that have worked in this field for many, many years, it is an opportunity for, for each of us to recognize individuals that um, go above and beyond, that um, just step up as community leaders, really, ultimately, um, and are willing to be the voice for the victims of our community. Um, and so with that, I recognize them. But the other, the other thing I don't want to leave, and wherever Chaplain Mindy is, um, is we also recognized a few weeks ago um, an outstanding service award. And that was to an organization that goes above and beyond in, in the spirit of volunteerism. And this year, we recognized the law enforcement chaplaincy and the good work that they do every day. Um, they are essentially the silent heroes that I would call, and as I said that day, they are the angels among us. And so with that, um, in this room, I would leave it at this when I say thank you to all of you. This is a room that is filled with heroes and angels, and uh, we, we need all of you, whether it's the members of law enforcement, whether it's the, our schools, whether it's faith-based organizations, whether it's our business community, whether it's nonprofits. We need each and every one of you to listen to our call to action 
and to be the heroes and to be the angels so that we can, in fact, enhance public safety in Sacramento. And with that, thank you. Thank you all for coming, and I look forward to all of you here next year. So have a great day. Have a great Friday.